Welcome to Thoughts on the Market. I'm Seth Carpenter, Morgan Stanley's Chief Global Economist. And I'm Gunit Dingra, Morgan Stanley's Head of U.S. Rate Strategy. And today on the podcast, we'll be discussing our updated economic and rates outlook for the rest of the year and into 2024. It's Monday, September 11th at 10 a.m. in New York. All right, Ganit, we are now about a week into September, and we can take stock of what we've learned over the summer. For macroeconomists like me, we care about growth, inflation, monetary policy. And I'd say this summer, spending indicators came in strong, inflation continued to fall, and we had Jackson Hole, the sort of nerd temple for monetary policy. And I have to say, we didn't learn quite as much as I hoped, but we kind of know the Fed is done hiking, or at least very close. But I have to say, in your domain, the Treasury yield is trading roughly four and a quarter percent. On the last day of June, when summer began, it was around 380. Can we just attribute the higher rate to thin liquidity and move on? You're right, Seth. It's not just thin liquidity. But the conditions of August definitely played a meaningful part in sending yields higher. Typically, as investors look to go away for August, positive carry trades are the easiest trades to have on. And playing for higher yields has been positive carry. Which is why I think in August this year, and even the last year, yields tended to go higher. But beyond August seasonality, which might be the simplest explanation, investors have four major narratives out there. That R star, the so-called neutral rate of interest, has increased. The end of yield curve control in Japan, more treasury supply, and more recently, at the end of the summer, increased supply of corporate debt. So before we go there, Seth, you mentioned Jackson Hole at the end of the summer, The idea that some investors have is that because the economy has held up so well, despite the Fed's rate hikes, that the underlying neutral rate or R star must be higher. And so we'll have higher interest rates not just now, but into the future. What is your take on this whole R star debate? And what have you learned from Jackson Hole? Absolutely. So I have to say, Jackson Hole was very interesting, but this time there were a lot of very academic-minded papers there that Very important to talk about. I can see how they can spur debate, but I'm not sure they provide that much that's actionable in the near term for the Fed or even for markets. And when it comes specifically to R star, color me a bit skeptical. And I say that for a few reasons. One, alternate explanations just abound. We could have got stronger spending because there's more residual impetus from the fiscal policy that's already in the pipeline. And in particular, if we look at where we missed our GDP forecast, a really big part of that was non-residential structures investment. So that can go a long way to explain it. Second, if our star really was higher, I think that would mean that the Fed would have to raise the peak rate during this hiking cycle even higher, not just rates off in the future. And so what does that mean? That means that I at least would have expected a parallel shift higher in rates, not just the long end selling off. And in fact, you might even see a steeper inversion of the curve as the rate goes higher in the near term, but then has to come down later. So take all of that together. And and I guess I'm just really not convinced that there's enough evidence to conclude that our star is higher. Yeah, makes a lot of sense, Seth. And listening to you about the growth and economic picture, I'm even more convinced that this our star story doesn't quite hold water. All right. So then there is the yield curve control story. And I will say, at the risk of patting myself on the back, our Japan team had been expecting a tweak to yield curve control in Japan, and we got it. But I know that you're skeptical that that's really the story here. Why do you push back? Yeah, I think one of the ways you can actually verify the impact of the yield curve control on the U.S. Treasury market is just break down the price action into different time zones. And what you saw is, In the Tokyo time zone, where you'd expect a lot of the so-called repatriation flows to play out, we haven't really seen much of a movement in U.S. Treasury yields ever since the YCC change announcement. So I would say, based on the time zone analysis, it doesn't look like YCC changes are really impacting Treasury yields. Okay, Ganit, I get it. So it wasn't from trading happening in Tokyo, but these sort of the markets are global. There could have been traders in London, traders in New York who were reacting to the change in yield curve control and selling their JGBs. And then the traders in Tokyo wake up and go, oh, nothing to do here. What do you make of that story? Why couldn't that be the explanation that it really was yield curve control? So if you break it down in the London time zone, it actually turns out that treasury yields have actually gone lower since the YCC announcement in the London time zone. To my mind, that speaks to the idea that maybe investors in those time zones are more focused on the weakness in the European economy than any changes to YCC. 
And speaking of the New York time zone, yes, it is true that the bulk of the sell-off in treasury yields has happened in New York time zone. But keep in mind, if hedge funds are the only major players selling yields on the back of the YCC, and it's not quite backed up by repatriation flows, it's probably not likely going to be sustainable. Then let's turn to the last one, increased supply of debt, both treasury debt and corporate debt. So we know that the U.S. deficit is high. Issuance will have to continue for some time. We've heard all of the stories about corporates starting to stir in capital markets and issue more. Shouldn't it be logical that if demand for assets is roughly unchanged, but the supply goes up, the price will fall, which should lead to a sell-off in rates? What do you make of that story? Yeah, the story is pretty logical, but I don't think it still answers the question. If supply was really the main driver, I would expect to see more of a substantial tightening in so-called swap spreads, which is the gap between treasury yields and the equivalent swap rates. We haven't really seen much of a tightening in swap spreads, which really undercuts the idea that treasury supply is weighing on investors' minds. All right. So I think we've gone through a bunch of the narratives, pushed back on a lot of them, maybe debunked them a little bit. I guess the one other question I would have for you is, could it be that markets are waking up to the higher for longer narrative? The Fed's been trying to say that they're going to keep interest rates as high as they need to for as long as they need to in order to bring inflation back to target. Maybe the market's putting more probability on that sort of outcome. Just to pretend I'm smarter than The economists. I will use the word bear steepening of the curve here. So in my view, the recent bear steepening of the two stands curve is a combination of two things. Number one, there has been very little change in the market implied Fed fund path through the end of 2024. And number two, the back end has moved higher with some combination of August seasonality and belief around a higher R star. So I would say it is less about the quote unquote higher for longer expectation but more about the idea that the Fed fund eventually settles at a higher level in the medium term. Okay, I guess that's fair. Let's take a step back, though, and take stock of what it is that we've learned. You and I and our colleagues have published work recently basically saying, here's the mid-year outlook we published in May. Here are the data that we got over the course of the summer. What did we get right? And what did we get wrong? In econ, I'd say we got right the continued and pretty rapid fall in inflation in the U.S., and the slowing in the labor market, and I'm pretty proud of that. But boy, we got wrong just how strong the U.S. economy would be. And in very stark contrast, we missed just how weak the Chinese economy would be. Boy, we really thought that there'd be a stronger, more vigorous policy response that would get better traction and we'd see a bigger cyclical rebound. What are your key takeaways from what you and your colleagues in strategy have learned over the summer? To start with some numbers, we had 10-year yields ending at 3.5% by the end of 2023. Currently, they're around four and a quarter. We think we missed two things. First, the market's focus on upside in growth rather than the cooling of inflation. And number two, we missed the investors and how they're behaving once bitten twice shy about adding duration until every data point cools down convincingly. Having said that, your forecast is for more cooling in growth and inflation through the year. And so we have only marginally raised our 10-year forecast to 3.65% by the end of this year. I have to say, Ganit, every time I talk to you, I learn something new. So thank you for taking the time to talk. Great speaking with you, Seth. And thanks to the listeners for listening. If you enjoy Thoughts on the Market, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and share the podcast with a friend or colleague today. The preceding content is informational only and based on information available when created. It is not an offer or solicitation, nor is it tax or legal advice. It does not consider your financial circumstances and objectives and may not be suitable for you. 